Hi, and welcome to my very first review of a monitor. Today I'm covering the LG 24GM79G, a full HD 144Hz TN panel monitor with FreeSync that retails for around $250. You may be wondering why I'm bothering to review a monitor that's already several years old, but this LG has a broad feature set including things like adaptive refresh and a blur reduction mode. Oh, and it also overclocks to 170Hz. This gives me the chance to run my full range of tests. So consider this more of a review template, where I'll discuss how I measure, what those measurements mean, and since I'm a huge CRT guy, I'll give plenty of comparisons with the CRT that was manufactured in 2002. Starting with the physical design, the monitor looks quite understated and good. The image fits nicely inside the bezel without having pixels cut off. Front and center are a selection of preset buttons, but realistically these have limited use because LG doesn't allow custom color settings for these, and you also can't have one exclusively for backlight strobing. That's a global toggle. The stand is totally fine, offering the usual height adjustment, tilt, swivel, and rotation. The back of the screen has a 100mm VESA mount, two HDMI ports, one display port, a USB hub, and a headphone jack. But now onto one of the most important aspects. How does the screen actually look? It ships with a relatively standard anti-glare coating, and some moderate rainbow speckling can be seen when viewing a full white image. More problematic, though, are the moving, faint, horizontal lines running throughout the screen at certain refresh rates. They're most visible on mid-level uniform patches of color, which is most of your desktop experience, and once you see them, you can't unsee them. Many Amazon reviews mention these as a primary drawback. Weirdly, 120Hz shows them quite clearly, but at 119Hz, they vanish. Alright, now onto the actual measurements. Once calibrated, the LG maintains a fairly consistent contrast ratio of about 940 throughout all of its brightness settings. That's in line with other TN panels. Out of the box, the brightness slider sits at 70, which puts the display at about 270 nits, which is very bright. But the LG has a good range of brightness that goes from slightly less than 100 nits to around 330 nits. Speaking of those out-of-the-box settings, the first thing to mention is the default gamma mode, mode 2. It starts fitted reasonably close to the BT1886 gamma curve, with a gamma of 2.4, but past about 70% white, it ventures off into crazy town. Gamma 4 gets closest to reference and was used for all of my calibrated measurements. A quick note about why I'm not using gamma 2.2 as that reference. The gamma you use for your own display should depend on your viewing conditions. In a light room, a higher gamma might mean you can't see any dark details, whereas in a dark room, a lower gamma could make everything look washed out. Based on my viewing conditions, I prefer BT1886, with its slight gamma rise in the dark end, but a higher gamma throughout the mid to high range. As long as the display offers a reasonable selection of gamma curves, I'm happy. For the LG, though, 3 out of 4 are bad, so no points there. Grayscale was consistently too green before calibration, leading to an average delta E of 3.1. A few OSD tweaks brought most grayscale patches back to proper gray, but you can see the trade-off for the overall lower delta E. The darkest gray is now of a strong blue push. It doesn't look as bad as it measures, though. Moving on to HDFR's color checker, the out-of-box settings return a delta E average of 3.3. I can only improve that slightly with my OSD calibrations, because the shift to gamma mode 4 messes up the magenta and cyan secondaries. This is about as good as you can get with the physical controls on the monitor. Now, a full software calibration is a tricky thing. If you have a colorimeter, you can definitely improve your monitor's color and gamma accuracy well beyond what's possible with OSD controls alone. If you happen to be doing color-critical work in the OS, a colorimeter is a good investment, but keeping that calibration in games is a bit harder. Many games will either unintentionally or intentionally disallow color profiles. For games that are ICC unaware, something like DisplayCal can force the game to use your profile. But Destiny 2, for instance, restricts any screen modification, even NVIDIA's own control panel adjustments. It's best to get as close as you can to accurate using only the on-screen display controls. For panel uniformity, I've provided two sets of five images. The top set are exposed to approximate how the monitor looks in real life. For the bottom set, I capture as much light as possible, increase the contrast dramatically, and then edit the result to middle gray. These show a worst case view of what's really going on with the screen. Before I get to the LG, I want to take a look at my Dell P1130 CRT, which was manufactured back in 2002. If you ignore the big bands across the screen that come from shooting a pulsed display, the CRT has an incredibly flat and uniform picture across the entire screen. 
someone local gave me this monitor for free just to get rid of it, and I've babied it ever since, making sure to always use a screensaver. But looking at the last two exaggerated shots, ignoring the moiré effect, there are several faint vertical lines running down the screen. Of course, I definitely wouldn't have seen the lines on the last black shot. That image had to be exposed for a full 25 seconds just to collect enough light to match the rest. Phosphor-based displays can definitely suffer from burn-in, and I have no idea how the monitor was treated before I got it. But now back to the LG. I just wanted to show how a very good display looks first. And the 24 gm 79 g performs quite well. Looking at the realistic shots first, there's no obvious splotchiness in the white and 50% gray shots. The 20% shot mostly just shows the bad vertical viewing angle of the TN panel. The last two shots, 5% in black, can really highlight any glowing or backlight bleed. The LG is a bit splotchy, but the biggest issue I have is the band of backlight bleed running along the bottom of the screen. This is noticeable in real content. Taking in the exaggerated shots, full white isn't as clean as it could be. The corners are a bit darker than the rest of the screen, having a kind of pinched in look, and the center is a bit hotter than the rest. 50% and 20% look A-OK, -okay, but the darker images show a bit of light bleed, and especially with black, that band across the bottom. The LG is actually pretty good here. I have a 40 inch Samsung TV that's about five times worse. Let's transition now into pixel response times. If you've read any monitor review, you've probably seen a chart that looks much like this on TFT Central, Hardware Unboxed, or in a slightly different form on prad.de. They're all attempting to measure and chart how quickly a pixel can change from one state to another. But since I'm presenting three graphs here, I want to go through and show how each of these is measured and what they mean. In reverse order from right to left, I have first response, real response, and then something I'm calling cumulative absolute deviation. To show how these numbers are derived, let's take a look at the actual measured response times of the LG 24 gm 79 g rising from a mid-gray to a light gray, and then falling back with the high overdrive setting. The first thing to look at in this chart are the teal and maroon lines. The center of each group of three is the average high or low level for that particular signal level. The outside lines are plus and minus three standard deviations, which encompass more than 99% of the steady state measurements. These are the limits of where I can determine where the signal either leaves or enters the target level. At the left, the signal leaves its low level and enters the high level quite quickly. I record this as the first response time. And if we go back and look at the response time chart, most of these first response times look pretty good. These are the response times that people in marketing would want to show you. But this measure doesn't truly represent what's actually happening. With overdrive set to fast, the LG is targeting a higher gray level and flies well past the steady state high level. This overshoot error is what other sites are reporting as a percentage of the total signal level. I'll come back to that in a moment. As we trace the response, the monitor finally comes back down and hits its appropriate level here. This is the time that I'm reporting as the real response of the display. I think this gives a much more realistic summary of the display than first response does. First response is like a runner trying to steal second by sprinting past second base. It doesn't matter if you got there fast. I'm providing these two charts to give a better general idea of the display's behavior, but also so you can properly compare my results with the reporting from other sites. But I think I have a better measure of the all-around performance of a display's pixel transitions, and that's the CAD. I've put the cumulative absolute deviation first on the slide because I think it's the most important. An ideal display would instantly transition from one state to the next with no overshoot, or just as bad, a long, slow undershoot. So far I've only been talking about overshoot, but undershoot is the same problem, just in reverse. They're both deviations from what the display ought to be doing. The response should be this. All this extra area away from perfect is error. Cumulative absolute deviation sums all this up. Both the longer you spend away from ideal and how far you are away, either over or under, contribute to the CAD, something that overshoot error as a percentage doesn't fully capture. Let's go back to the chart and compare the rise and fall times for this response. Just eyeballing, the falling transition appears to happen faster and with less overshoot to boot. For the first response, 127 to 223 happens in just 3.1 milliseconds, and it's reverse in 2.2 milliseconds. Both are quite good. But looking at the real response, the rise takes 24 milliseconds. The fall is bad as well at 16.2 milliseconds. But I think the CAD shows the real story. The rise has a CAD of 252.0, the fall 160.1. The rise has a CAD that's 58% higher, directly corresponding to the difference in area. Okay. With all that in mind, I usually start at the display's native refresh rate and check the various overdrive settings in the OSD. Looking at overdrive off first, notice the first response and real response are exactly the same. 
this really is overdrive off. But I'm seeing a lot of red in these charts, so let's switch over to overdrive fast. It's immediately apparent that first response times improved dramatically. Real response times are a mixed bag, but the cat improves for everything except for black to gray transitions. Putting the response time at normal has slightly slower first response, but the CAD graph is much better. This is where we want to be. And so the rest of the testing will be with overdrive set to normal. To get an idea of what these settings look like in practice, I'll be making use of Blurbuster's fantastic test UFO website. The slide I'm showing now shows pursuit photos at the three different overdrive settings we've looked at so far. Looking at off and fast, you may find one in particular more egregiously bad than the other. Fast has bright halos behind the alien, slow has smeary color trails, but both have error, just in different directions. Normal is the best compromise between the two, and LG knew this, which is why it's the normal option. Normal also performs best in the CAD measurement. I'll talk more about pursuit photos when talking about backlight strobing a little later on. With normal selected as the best overdrive setting, I tested response times at a variety of refresh rates. If I quickly run through the graphs in reverse order from 170 to 144 to 100 and finally to 60 Hz, watch the CAD and real response. I'll run through that several times. This time, let's pay attention to one particular real response, 63 to 127. At 170 hertz, it takes 6.6 .6 milliseconds, which is just slower than the refresh time. At 144 hertz, it now takes 7.4 milliseconds, again, just slower than the refresh cycle. Same story at 100, and finally at 60 hertz. This indicates that the LG 24GM79G can only adjust its drive voltage once per frame. The first responses are all similar, meaning they're all similarly overdriven to the high level, but the panel can't drive back down to the target level until the next frame. So at 60 hertz, the real response, and consequently the CAD, are necessarily worse. Another thing to take a particular look at is why the transitions from 0 to 255, full black to full white, for both real and first responses are better at 100 hertz than they are at 170 hertz. 100 hertz has an 8 millisecond advantage over 170 hertz, which seems dramatic and counterintuitive based on what I was just discussing. Let's take a close look at the two response graphs overlaid to see why this is. Here I've overlaid the two responses, fuchsia for 100 hertz and green for 170 hertz. I suspect most people, when presented with this picture, would say that there is almost no difference between these two responses. But if you look closely at the green 170 hertz response, there's a small shelf just before it reaches its steady state high average. That shelf accounts for the additional 8 milliseconds. This might lead you to believe that both the first and real response graphs are a bit untrustworthy. And you're not far off. But let's go back to the cumulative absolute deviation. At 170 Hz, the CAD from 0 to 255 is 193.3. At 100 Hz, the CAD is 190.5. There is practically no difference, and that better reflects your intuitive comparison of the graphs. And one final note about these before I bore everyone to death. Watch the falling transition from white, 255, to light gray, 223, as we run through 60 Hz to 170 Hz. It sticks out like a sore thumb. Let's take a look at why. The slow fall time coupled with this foot give this particular transition one of the worst CAD scores measured. But it also happens to measure bad for both real and first transitions. Other than Blurbuster's pursuit photos, one of my go-to torture tests for LCD response is the Gaia 3D star map. As you pan and rotate the camera, the stars seem to disappear until their transitions can finally catch up. This manifests as momentary brightness drops. Anyone who's played Skyrim on a VA panel will recognize this behavior right away. But even a fast TN panel is not fast enough to pass this test, unlike a CRT. As we move on to input lag, this next chart is going to need a pretty good amount of explanation. In order to measure the input lag or processing delay of a monitor, I use a light probe together with a microcontroller. The microcontroller sends a key press over USB to a custom Unreal Engine scene running at a V-synced off 1000 frames per second, which is a 1 millisecond frame time. Unreal continuously listens for a key press, and when it receives one, it switches the scene from white to black. I record the difference in time with microsecond precision from when the microcontroller sends the key press to when I first measure a change in the LCD's light output. Looking at this waterfall plot, though, you can see that I have to take a lot of measurements. In fact, this is only 255 out of the 1020 that I actually take. 
Excel only allows you to graph 256 series at a time. The reason that I need to take so many is that based on where I put the light probe on the screen and where in the display's refresh cycle the key press comes in, I might completely miss the color change. In a worst case scenario, I just miss the transition and have to wait a full display cycle to catch it. For the best case, the screen changes right at the light probe. But the screen could change at any point in between. This gives a uniform distribution of fall times, somewhere between the best case scenario and the full refresh cycle later. This particular waterfall plot was measured with the screen at 144 Hz, though that won't matter for the lag testing. You can see that the very best measurement starts falling at around 2 milliseconds. The very worst is somewhere around 9.7 milliseconds. But most fall within that 6.9 millisecond 144 Hz window. The variation at the outside occurs because the microcontroller's key press isn't always synced with the USB packet. Some key presses are sent quickly, others take a bit longer. The LG's best response occurred in 2.03 milliseconds. But how much delay was the monitor responsible for? At 1000 FPS, Unreal takes one millisecond to render its frame. That's some of the delay taken into account, but to find out how much the USB key press takes up, I need a display with no lag. Aha! My Dell CRT works great for this. And right below the LG's best response, you can see the CRT's best response based again on 1020 samples. A CRT does no processing, so the 1.5 milliseconds of delay is only the USB packet send time and Unreal's 1 millisecond render time. The difference is the estimated processing lag of the LG. LG advertises the 24GM79G with a 1 millisecond motion blur reduction mode that strobes the backlight. I suspect you may have inferred from all the CRT talk earlier that I'm a big fan of motion clarity. I find a strobing backlight to be essential for playing games, even if it means I can't use any of the VRR modes. For FPS titles, I need to be able to track enemies as they move across the screen. For racing games, I want to be able to clearly read the brake markers and the road signs. I'm a bit sad for youngsters who've grown up with LCDs who don't realize you ought to be able to see things as they move. The LG can strobe at 144, 120, 160 Hz refresh rates only, but the strobing at 60 Hz is unusable, which I'll get into later. It's fairly simple to turn on the 1 millisecond motion blur reduction mode in the OSD, but unfortunately, the monitor doesn't allow different brightness settings for the backlight strobing on and off. So for instance, I usually keep the screen at about 180 nits, but turning on strobing drops that dramatically. Each time then, I need to go into the OSD and turn the brightness all the way up. And then when going back to the desktop, I have to turn the brightness back down. It's a bit of an irritation. You can see here from the chart, the LG can maintain a pretty good brightness even during strobing, and it maintains nearly the same contrast ratio as without strobing. 150 nits is good enough, even in a fairly bright room. LG maintains that same brightness for all the refresh rates by using a consistent 33% duty cycle. 33% on, 67% off. But based on the strobe durations, which are all greater than 2 milliseconds, I'm not sure where their 1 millisecond motion blur reduction is coming from. Shorter strobe durations do lead to better motion clarity, but at the expense of max brightness. I've highlighted in red the pulses per frame on 60 Hz because there, the LG double strobes. Double strobing is actually worse than not strobing at all, and I'll show that in a moment. TV manufacturers are willing to add strobing at 60 Hz, usually calling the modes something like sports motion or clear motion or clear action. But for some reason, monitor makers are hesitant to allow users to strobe at 60 Hz, perhaps to prevent users complaining about headaches. But many games, even modern games, are limited to 60 Hz. I've been playing a lot of The Crew 2 recently, a game that's stuck at 60 Hz. On a CRT, it's still amazing. On my Samsung TV, I can turn on strobing, and it's not as amazing because of lots of other issues, but it's still pretty good. On this LG, I can't read any signs as I'm going past them, and since I'm at 60 Hz, the overdrive isn't working at full capacity. Looking from the bottom of the slide to the top, the 144 Hz cycle repeats appropriately every 6.9 milliseconds, the 120 Hz at 8.3 milliseconds, and the 100 Hz at 10 milliseconds. I have no issues with the strobe timing here. But for 60 Hz, LG just uses the same strobing as they use for 120 Hz. Okay, enough of my ranting about 60 Hz strobing. Let's now take a look at these strobing pursuit photos. From left to right, the 60 Hz double strobing is terrible. Strobing, though, is quite usable at 100 to 144 Hz. Clarity is better at 144Hz because the strobe duration is a full 1 millisecond shorter, but if you have trouble maintaining a consistent 144Hz in games, these lower refresh rates are totally usable. <clears throat> the strobe crosstalk slide gives an idea of both the pixel response times and the timing of the strobe. 
The ideal strobe should be timed so the center of the display is the cleanest, and looking here, LG did a pretty good job, although there's no option to adjust either the strobe timing or duration. The top of the screen shows the next frame developing, the bottom shows the remnants of the previous frame. This is still dramatically worse than a CRT, but it's decent for an LCD. Because the monitor must delay the strobe until most of the transitions have occurred, strobing always invokes some latency penalty. Input lag increased during 144Hz strobing to a not too bad 4.89 milliseconds. The last topic to cover is a viewing angle comparison. There should be no surprise here that a TN panel doesn't have the greatest viewing angles, but it's important just to see how much we've lost. The LG also has the TN characteristic of rising black levels off axis. In particular, this picture shows just how amazing a CRT can be. All right. That may seem to have ended this rather long first review on a sour note, but the LG does have advantages over the CRT that I've carefully skirted around, especially since for most of you, finding a good condition CRT on the used market is near impossible, and then actually using it with a modern graphics card is not a trivial task either. The problem with reviewing a two-year-old monitor is that I can't really make a proper recommendation for buyers today. Overall, the LG is a well-featured full HD TN monitor. If that's what you're looking for, and you can find it at a deep discount, it's not a bad purchase in 2019. Future reviews won't be this long, as I don't need to rehash all my measurement procedures. If you have any suggestions, or perhaps have qualms with my methodology, please let me know in the comments.